Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I'm extremely excited to uh, say these things uh, to you, one-on-one, wherever you're sitting in the world. Hey, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I realize when I start this episode, it almost, in my head, feels like I have to give you an update on the world um, and kind of, you know, recap the news, but eh, it's not a news podcast, but uh, I do talk about stuff in the the kind of world we live in, which interests me. And right now, nothing's interesting me because I feel it's just a repetition of things or different things happening in the same way or different events which are kind of representing the same kind of themes. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, sometimes you have five movies which are great, but no one talks about them because they kind of uh, I wouldn't say remakes, but what the fuck am I talking about? I have no clue. But mm, I think there is some sense of, at least in my place where I am right now, to create this 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 space for myself where I'm able to kind of be without um, trying too hard not to be, if that makes any sense at all, which I'm sure it doesn't. Uh, let me explain, my friend. I think... Um, there is so much pressure or rather there's so much uh, need to kind of become a certain person and as a result you kind of put all these things in place or you put all these plans into play to become a certain idea of who you think you are and in the process there's so much possibility for other inputs which aren't yours to kind of shape you into finally a a person or a being that you aren't really comfortable being and then as a result you put new plans into place you put new kind of ideas out there you kind of project new versions of who you want to be and it's an ongoing thing and the reason why I'm talking so much about this is because I'm in the process process being the key word of writing a book well let me again explain I'm not really actually physically typing out the book I'm kind of talking the book out loud I'm kind of I've got someone who's a person who's he's a right he's I think yeah he's a writer of course but he's very good at constructing and putting together um, things which people talk to him about eh, I think that's I'm doing a horrible explanation of what he does he's basically a writer and if you want to call him a biographer I don't know if that's the right word but he um, is good at stitching it together to a flow and I'm horrible at that because the moment I write I used to write a couple of blogs and I never could edit them because just going back that piece was boring for me. But what I do love doing, uh, yeah, so basically I'm not good at editing and that's maybe why I keep going on and on and on. And But at the same time, I tell this guy my entire story. So I'm kind of, it's like an audio book without being an audio book because I'm kind of telling the audio book to one person and they kind of document it. And that process has been, whoa, quite intense because um, we, the, the, this guy is really, really, really good uh, because I realized when I'm talking out loud, like what I'm doing now, it's it's fun. But to kind of document these stories in a book, uh, you kind of need to be directed in some way with 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 kind of qu- questions or ideas that you might not come up with on your own. So in that way, it's really really been. F- uh, I wouldn't say fun alone because it has been definitely fun. That's why I'm doing it. But it's also been in some way a quite um, a deep level of introspection and facing uh, some of the stuff which is honestly been hard to face. But I've uh, in some way felt lighter for, for, for doing that because I kind of just said it as it is. Because here's the main reason for writing the book, right? Because I'm getting a sense that a lot of people who are whining in their books saying, oh, because of all these situations, because of all these people, because of all the things that happen, I am this and therefore feel bad or, or you know, whatever the, the, the emotion they're seeking. But I don't want to do any of that because I feel there is a, a reason for this book. The reason is basically I want to make... Um, want some sense of closure. This is more for myself because I don't know if anyone read it, but it's more for myself. It's a sort of place where I want to say, okay, let's now look at where we are and start things 
in on this path um and it's 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 in no way a justification it's in no way throwing anyone under the bus because i think those kind of acts are really dickish because you can't really uh, get the other person's point of view when you're writing a book and putting your story out there it's not really fair because you say something about a person and then they have no way of either defending it or uh, kind of making their point unless they write a book because then it just becomes they write a book to kind of counter your point and you go back they write another book and then it's just like what the fuck are you doing this is not even a book about your story it's more about uh, you pointing and they pointing back and it becomes more of an explaining document so this is more to just um recognize it's more to um i think reflect uh, appreciate celebrate um a lot of the things that i've called my life over the past you know 30 i mean 40 years but uh 30 plus years where it's the events the people the situations the experiences everything because there is a tendency i feel to focus on highlights or there's a tendency to kind of manipulate the past uh, in a certain way to suit your story at this point in your life or to to kind of craft it in such a way that it it kind of that's the weird thing about memories right you can you can kind of change them or um give them some sort of treatment that suits your narrative at this point but as the narrative changes so do those memories but technically a memory is a memory which happened in a certain way but you obviously remember it in a certain version of that memory because that appeals to you or doesn't appeal to you it could also be a negative way which kind of brings you down and drags you down and i think that's what happens sometimes i look back and i'm like I, I, yeah while i say recognize reflect and celebrate of course you you, you kind of had this human thing to, of regret but you can't really do anything about it so there's no point going back and keep thinking about that in a loop so it's in, in a way it's to make peace with all those things all the kind of things that i did um to get through to be accepted to to kind of navigate um as a teenager as a young adult to kind of find my way around um gr- groups and acceptance friends and 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 family and 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 that's where the celebration comes because everyone kind of plays out a certain role in your life and you have and as what i started out with is you have this idea of what you want to do to get to a certain place but life has very different plans and when i look back and if i had had it my way uh as sanatra said it would have been a very boring boring fucking book that i'd be sitting here today trying to write but man i just want to document what life gave me what life threw at me what life put me through because i think it's uh, if nothing else not not this is absolutely not to big me up but it's just to say hey you know what if you you don't have control but if you let life or other if you acknowledge and recognize what life gives you uh yeah and many times it's really really hard many times it seems like there's no hope but when you look back and you're if you're in a position to kind of sit down and look at what you've been through and if you're in a position uh, where you're able to withstand that i think it's a really good thing to look at because it's truly the, the only thing that um in in to the largest possible extent be a unique experience for you and that's the thing to juxtapose what life has laid out for you versus uh what you might i just feel the former makes for a better book and i want to put that out there basically this was i don't know what a justification for writing a book but i don't know i just wanted to put that out there and i let you know it's 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 a few months out but you'll be first to know about it here on the podcast and we'll figure out what to do around it and about it anyhow uh, speaking of that memory is such a an important thing right like from a young age we're given memory tests where kind of patted on the back for how much knowledge we can memorize how ma- how many multiplication 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 what the fuck is that multiplication tables we can memorize and it's a very very inherent um skill that people uh try to put instill in kids and today's guest anthony metivier is a founder of the magnetic memory method um and 
I got him on because I think it's really interesting the the emphasis on memory also on the memory we have and how that influences us and how we can either be well confined or weighed down by a memory but also on the other hand kind of use it as a skill to enhance certain aspect of our lives and i found it uh, a very fascinating conversation and i think you will as well so well i'm not going to ramble on about anthony because you know what you got to listen to him to find out what he has to say so without further ado my guest in today's episode anthony metabie thank you for listening and till the next episode goodbye god bless take care of yourselves cheers Anthony Metuvier, welcome to the Soapy Dow Show. It's a pleasure having you here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm honored and grateful and and humbled. Thank you. You know, you said something just before we started recording, which I uh, which caught my interest. Uh, you were talking about the, the the Greek play and how people really um, can't escape themselves how much ever they try, right? With all the manipulation and all the preparation, ends up sort of shoot, they end up shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, but Do, do do you sense there that we live in a time where there is so much work put into not being yourself? Yeah, but I don't know that that's anything new. Yeah. There's so much in history and that's why we were talking about that Greek play mm-hmm. where an individual Oedipus Rex is trying to avoid being what a prophecy said he would be. Oedipus Rex yeah. was told, "You will kill your father, you will sleep with your mother." And he was not going to do that so he 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 wasn't quite aware of his backstory he had been adopted and he's like i'm not going to do this so he leaves his parents home so he's not anywhere that they could possibly be but he brings his ego with him and his ego yeah. is so big that when he meets a guy on a chariot on the road and they have a scuffle he kills that dude and then he finds out that he just killed the king of thebes he becomes the king of thebes and he's therefore already killed his father <laughs> and he's now sleeping with his mother because he just took the old king's wife so we're living in this time in all time it's a story of ego some people managing to deal with it other people not i don't think the ego goes away no matter how many mantras you recite but you can learn to manage it better mm. and we just have this wonderful pinball machine that the world is new people are coming in all the time old people who had great wisdom are exiting and we just keep needing to learn and relearn the same lessons or as andrew geed uh, andre geed i think pr- pr- uh, said um you know we just have to keep s- <laughs> hearing the same lessons over and over and over again because we weren't paying attention the first time around and uh, part of my passion is making sure we pay better attention yeah the first time if we can Now, and that's something which is uh what um we are lacking in some way when it comes to uh where we look to for wisdom because we have plenty of knowledge we have plenty of information but when it comes to the value systems that we hold dear to us uh they seem to have shifted right now um everyone i mean i don't want to demonize any tool or any sort of technology or any sort of uh thing that we're living with but there are some that are more powerful than others like the 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 idea of short form content attention economies or social media platforms that drive a certain way communities interact or uh, generations interact and this is across the board from the young unformed mind to even 50 year old or 60 year old um adults who are obsessed with whatsapp or obsessed with tiktok or with short form so the thing is clearly there's a desperation to hold on to youth and to hold on to uh, values that represent youth and there's also simultaneously a, a clear indication that as you get older your worth in society drops so what is that um that particular mix because there is all these uh, innovations and medications that are being sold and being promoted and researched to keep youth uh, and keep age at bay um so what is that kind of do to a society or do to even a, a a culture i don't don't want to say one culture but each culture has a different thing but there are um 
especially in the east and you can even say in certain indigenous tribes there is a huge uh, amount of weight put to uh, el- elders and the wisdom they carry and how they can guide a tribe or a society in in the right direction and that clearly um is changing right it's changing but i don't know if it's changing as much as we think it's changing hmm. i think we also need to think about the nature of the change right so hmm. the brain is clearly not changing and not changing nearly as fast as one would think if it, if the brain is changing it's that it's just being turned into mush a lot faster because of dopamine spiking and there's nothing wrong with dopamine in the brain there are there's a phenomenon called tonic dopamine mm. which is you know regulating that nice feeling of dopamine which you can do through a variety of means meditation being one of them but these platforms and so forth yes they're new Yes, there's a quote unquote acceleration of overwhelming information and it's only just getting started because we're going to get bombed with robot content. And mm. the and I don't call it AI content. I think that people are jumping to the gun by calling this artificial intelligence. Yeah. It's not even particularly artificial because it's trained on human content and it's not particularly intelligent. It's robot content. Let's let's call a spade a spade. And the uh, robots are engineered to do a certain thing by human beings. So right and there that, that and they're referring to content created by human beings. So you get problems in recursion which is kind of like a, a side noodle topic but right. <laughs> which I'm happy to get into. But yeah, yeah case, absolutely after the, this yeah. The, the the core thing that I think is so important to understand is that humans cluster around things. We swarm right it's like yeah. remember in the old days when you you would have like a new movie come on the internet and the illegal download places you'd have like this swarm of activity and then it would peter out and you would have the hardest time in the world to download the thing because nobody's sharing it anymore right yeah yeah well that that's not new that doesn't have anything to do with the technology that has to do with human swarming behavior that would have happened pre-internet in back in the day like some new shipment of some delicatessen has arrived in the city square and you get the swarm and then it's depleted we just yeah you know this is the, this is the image in the matrix like matrix 3 or even matrix 1 where the bots are just or the you know they're just mm. swarming in like crazy and then they dissipate well that movie's and not and even about the black friday robots. sales you have That's in america and uh, after thanksgiving it's just like yeah. the swarms right yeah. yeah but that those images in movies like the matrix where those robots are swarming on things that's not an image of robots that's an image of humans yeah. that's what humans do right yeah, it just yeah. brrr, and then they're gone yeah, and yeah. so these new technologies and so forth that's exactly what we see oh facebook all of a sudden all these users oh tiktok all of a sudden all these users it's swarm it's going to dissipate it takes 10 years takes 100 years who knows kodak <laughs> what's that right but yeah. kodak had a very very long atten- uh, gri- 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 grip but it dissipated eventually and the behaviors around Kodak they just got replaced by now let's say Apple right and mm. and iPhone technologies and blah 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 but it's still a photograph <laughs> you know at, at its fundamental level so i often think of Oedipus Rex which i gain is useful here Oedipus Rex is not just about the guy who killed his father and slept with his mother it's also about somebody who's dealing with what was called the changing of the guard so why that he has to confront his past and figure out that actually he was a guy who did that is because there are new ships coming into Thebes they're bringing new medicines the ships themselves are new technology and the citizens of Thebes are saying you know we got these problems you have to deal with these things they're technologically induced problems and in the ancient greek world they had this word which was um uh Uh, let me see if i can dig out of my memory palaces here this uh the, the pharmacon that's what it was mm-hmm. <laughs> so the pharmacon is where we get the word pharmacy from but yeah. it has this really interesting nuance because basically what pharmacon means is the cure that is a poison and the poison that is a cure and every new technology is like that a double edged sword so, for lack of a better word yeah. yeah nothing new about this problem nothing new about it at all and mm. the only thing that we need to focus on is are we going to get those old people 
to share with the younger people those stories so that we don't miss that knowledge. But there's a double-edged sword even in the wisdom of old people because there's a hell of a lot of ignorance. There's a hell of a lot of short-sightedness. There's a hell of a lot of biases in the brain. And old people are repeating stuff that just simply never was true in the first place. And we just go, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, old, must be good. And that's not true. So the real crisis that we have is the crisis of big data and the tyranny of metrics where we're being told, well, graph and chart says X, that will be true for you. But the reality is, is that map is never the territory. And you, like we have a problem with scientism. Oh, look, the science says it's okay. Science willing, we had a bunch of people saying. It's like, give me a, what are you doing? Like, where is scientific literacy? So they're breaking human beings into data points, basically. Well, yeah, and, and the problem is, is that it's not that human beings are not data points. Yeah. The real problem is, is that you are the scientist in the laboratory of your own life. Yeah. And even if your life does have statistically analyzable impacts on all kinds of people, you still have to live it. You still have to run the experiments. You have to study your own quote unquote data. And if you're going to allow mass big data to cause misery in your own life, then that's ultimately on you because there is no such thing as science. Science is, well, there is such a thing as science. It's a tool used to create evidence that either confirms or denies human hypotheses about the world. Now, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but yeah. in a nutshell, that's all it is. And it's not something that you follow. It's not something that you believe. That's called scientism. It's yeah. actually the opposite. It's yeah, the tool yeah. that you use to doubt and then validate whether your doubt is correct or not. So this is the real risk that we face is yeah. Google I as religion. The religion <laughs> so of, uh, I think anything when it starts becoming um, a guiding principle i think it's a little worrying because even something like horoscopes or you look at astrology if you just sit back and say you know what's the point anyway in five years this is going to happen like what you said with the story the greek play it's the same approach right if you say oh anyway i've been analyzed and i'm this the kind of person i'm going to be i'm just going to you know sit back and 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 i think that's that's where the idea of 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 the true meaning of responsibility is right is to work with um the kind of things you've been given in life and a lot of people want to push that away saying oh i'm responsible i i, I provide and which is of course important things but when it comes to a very human experience you want to kind of pass it on to someone else saying can you handle this for me yeah yeah, yeah. and that's a deep need a psychological mm. need to have your experience your knowledge recognized by the other at mm-hmm. least considered, if not implemented. But this is this is what ethics is, or it's part of what ethics is, is you actually knowing the value and being able to demonstrate that it's value. Because again, there's lots of people who just spout stuff that simply never was true in the first place. And just because you're an elder citizen doesn't mean that it's, wow, super valuable. Mm. It, 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 what we would want to encourage is metacognition radical metacognition which is constant reflection is this true why is it true why do i think it's true what's the history by which that i came to think that such a thing was true and if i retrace that history then what better truth might i discover in that journey and also when might i see that truth was actually used as a lie and lies were actually used as truth and then there's a kind of principle of metaphoric truth, right? Which makes, <laughs> muddies the water and so yeah. forth. But I like what you said about the idea that we got to deal with the package that we're given. Uh, Heidegger, the German philosopher, Martin Heidegger, he had this word that he used a lot, which in German is geworfenheit, which means thrownness. That's like the best way you would it would translate it, I think. Mm-hmm. Thrownness into the world. And that's what that's what you got to deal with. And he had a bunch of ideas, you know, deal with it this way, that way, not a little more of that, less, less of that, and so forth. I don't know if you want to follow his advice, but I love that uh, idea of being thrown into the world, which, you know, you're born, but you're also thrown. You know, there's just endless configurations and possible configurations going on, and you do need to navigate it. And there, there, there are undoubtedly better ways to navigate it. And then you just have to be grateful and lucky for when you have those better ways 
because it easily could have been the case that you didn't. And there's another thing which we are constantly driven by is the end game, right? Like there's always going to be something better when we move. So like we have to strive towards a better future. We have to strive towards a better version of ourselves. We have to work for that better job, but we have to get more money, more promotions. And it's constantly this thing, thing which is leaving you lacking or at least a sense of lacking in your own mind because the, mm. if you want to call it the goalpost is constantly being moved or your, 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 what, you, what you are today is not what people expect. Uh, that's not the new standard or the new normal as people call it. So people are always being kept off balance if that's their way of looking at it, right? You said that you said people are thrown into the world, which is great. But if they are facing the world, and this is something I want to talk to you about from um, from two points of view, right? One is from a self-development or rather a uh, development from an early sort of part in your life to also the way you are kind of driven by the value systems of where you are, um, whether it's an outcome-based value system, whether it's the family that pushes you to say, come on, go and make us proud so it it's great to be thrown into the world it's great to sort of think but if you're not able to see what you have or recognize or acknowledge or appreciate what you have as a result of who you are or who you are as a result of what you have uh i mean by that it's not just the 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 physical or the material i mean even the body and the mind and the the resources of family and friends how do you i mean how do you cope with being thrown into the world Mm. Well, I think you you cope, you cope and you cope and you cope some more because there's going to be more challenges for everybody, mm. you know, like there's not one amongst us who isn't going to lose friends or family members, or if we don't have friends and family members, we're going to lose that person we used to see in the park. You know, there's just loss is a part of of the system. So mm. I don't think it's like, how do you cope? I think it's what are the variety of ways that you will need to cope and how are you going to learn to recope and just come to be satisfied with the fact that these are the way the game is rigged. And there's a lot of people who are going to tell you that it's not rigged that way, but <laughs> you have all the evidence in the world to, you know, think cautiously around the spiritual stuff and the woo-woo stuff and the overt optimism and also be skeptical of the overt pessimism it's yeah, yeah. going to be it's going to be some sort of mix of all these things all these things appear in you so i feel in my experience my research years of depression and so forth if you can work on your memory then you're going to have a wider field for comparing contrasting remembering co a variety of coping tools, not just one. One is the most dangerous number when it comes to coping. Yeah. There's a variety <laughs> of coping tools that are yeah. contextual and an acceptance of this is the way that it is. And so memory conditioning, memory training is... Sorry, I'm going to really, interrupt really you for a second there because I want to ask you before, I've got, I really want to go, go down the path of memory, go down memory memory lane if you, <laughs> if you yeah, want to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, is coping even a good thing? Because it's spoken about like coping mechanisms. Coping is is portrayed in a light of someone who's struggling to keep up. Well, I mean, this is an interesting question, right? Because we can get super interested and nerdy, so to speak, about mm -hmm. the meaning of words. Mm -hmm. Or we can say, look, these are words that we use to describe the world. And we shouldn't use the word coping because somebody might have an image of struggle, right? Mm. This is this is getting, I think, too precious about the language that we use. But you're right. But also, I think that the stronger lesson that we can say is, look, we can't rely on language. Language is not sufficient to the cause. Yeah. You know, there's there's something that I'm very grateful that I came across in my early training, which was just the idea that you know, you're going to meditate and meditation is going to help you and so forth. But you can't go around in the world saying, oh, man, I didn't meditate today. So it's OK that I got angry at so and so. Mm -hmm. Right. That's turning <laughs> meditation into a crutch. Yeah. Right. You've got to be able to act and be cool in the world, no matter whether you meditated or not. You got to be able to be OK and be a good person in the world, whether you're 
coping or you're a stoic or you yeah. have next level strategies or whatever. The, the words aren't that important. They mm. should never be that important. They're just words. And so, yeah, I mean, you're you're absolutely right. But at the same time, I think we got to push further and we got to say, if whatever strategy you're using hinges upon the words that you're using to yeah. support that strategy, you're looking at it in a way that is less than optimal. And that's what the words are doing, the words of the terms, if you want to call it, is, is that you're they're defining people and giving them a sense of, oh, I'm better than you because I meditate or I'm, um, you know, I, I'm not as good as that person because that person's a, as you said, right, that person's a stoic. And But the so we're so bound because we don't want to dig deeper because you're as, as you said meditation doesn't end on the mat it's how you live your life it's how you're navigating the course and the journey and 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 it's fascinating right because people are so keen to attach themselves to things words that are trending like oh i'm i'm we're all anxious you know we're all depressed and not to take away from that the, some people genuinely are struggling with it they're not struggling with the word they're struggling with what that what that represents and you can't just move on from one thing to another right it's not a it's not a hashtag which is <laughs> I find that quite fascinating no but i think the nuance is, is they are struggling with the word the word has come to, there's a principle called reification mm. they have reified that word and there's definitely struggle because they've attached a whole world to the word and mm. so I mean, here's the way I think about it. I mean, everything appears in consciousness, right? Mm. And what I mean by it appears in consciousness is not some, oh, the big giant self of consciousness that connects the entire universe or mm. some pan psychic mm. nonsense. What I mean is that yourself is the thing that things appear in, your consciousness, right? Mm. And you are experiencing things because of how you operate things. Yeah. So if, if you get hung up on, I, and I know because I've done it, Right. Yeah. When I was diagnosed with manic depression, I hung on to that term like it was the Bible. And yeah, it yeah. meant everything. And it definitely had everything to do with my willingness to be identified, not only just with the word, but the definition in books, you know? Mm. And then I, I sought great meaning. I sought solace from it. And I realized one day I'm making myself sick because of my relationship to these words. I'm not getting better, I'm getting worse, you know? And uh, that's that's the trick that the machine is trying to play on you, right? Because it helps you continue to buy the pills. It helps you to continue to support the offices in which the psychotherapists give you more words. And those words help guide you towards certain behaviors, none of which in my case were, hey, have you ever looked at your diet? Hey, have you ever looked at any sort of mental training that you could undergo, like maybe working on your memory or learning a language that has been shown to fortify the brain against certain problems like this. No, 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 no. This is just all a chew you up in the pill crushing machine and it's sick at its core. Now that doesn't mean that those doctors don't mean well. It doesn't mean that there aren't benefits at large from the psychopharmaceutical industry, blah, blah, blah. But if you really analyze it, what it is trying to do at large is saying that mental illness is bad because it prevents certain people from participating in capitalism. And that's sick. That's broken at its core. Yeah. Because only the only way you're healthy is if you're able to go to a job to pay your taxes and not cause trouble for the other drones who go uncritically to their jobs so that they can pay taxes and never you know, rebel against the government, never question the status quo. And that's just, that's, that's the nightmare that I went to university to break only for universities to become the number one perpetrator of the myth that they taught me to see through. It's just a weird situation. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, as you said, it's the, yeah, it's the poison and the cure. Exactly. Forever, at least since ancient Greece, it hasn't changed. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I sometimes, uh, I'm a little hard on myself when it comes to memory, right? Because uh, I think we kind of, it's, it's, it's two ways I want to talk about memory. And of course, I want you to give me your findings. Um, but we always look back with a certain sense uh, of clarity, right? We have these things like hindsight, hindsight is twenty twenty, And so is that because we have a certain notion of what that was? Um 
because memory is obviously not going to be absolutely honest it's not going to be absolutely clear it's what you make of it right mm. so maybe can we start with that and then i want to just ask you a few more things in that space yeah well i think it comes back to this idea of of specifically the the size and the efficiency of your working memory mm. when we get hung up on the past look i can just see something that i just said that could create images in people's minds and the because of primacy effect which is like first things that you heard or the first thing that you paid attention to some people might have just heard what i just said oh that dude just critiqued capitalism must be a commie right mm -hmm. must be left mm -hmm. i'm not left at all i'm not right i'm not middle i just i disavow all of that identification yeah i'm a big fan of capitalism i think it's one of the best systems humanity has ever cooked up but that doesn't mean that i can't criticize it right yeah so absolutely. that sort of hindsight thing that, that that people have is that they don't have enough hindsight they don't have enough space in their minds to say wow like what's the context of this criticism where did that guy ever learn those things right they're just like mm -hmm. oh said this must be that right mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that that's like a weird bias that that people have in the minds and part of it has to do with not enough working memory to juggle more than one thought at the same time in the mind so when we have a hindsight bias or you know we think that we've learned things after the fact you're right. Memory is not accurate all the time. It changes. There's incredibly weird and strange things. Like they do experiments where they take people and they say, do you remember that fight that you had with your boyfriend on the lawn two days ago and you wound up at the police station? And the people will say, uh, I remember we were disagreeing about something, but I don't remember going to the police station, let alone a fight. And they'll go, oh, no, no, no. And they'll get their parents in on the exper experiment or the boyfriend or whoever. And they'll say, yeah, yeah, we were at the police station. And that person will invent a memory that Oof. is yeah. totally coherent. And it will take different amounts of time for different people. But they will believe that that happened to them. And to varying degrees, we do this to ourselves all the time. And... I'm I'm hypersensitive to it because I'm often on these shows and people say, tell your story. And I've told my story over and over and over again to the point that it's just like, well, is that what, <laughs> you know, like, and I hear things coming out of my own mouth and then I correct myself, you know, actually a little more nuance on this or whatever. And also that's another thing. We use shorthand all the time. Mm -hmm. Our own shorthand can change our memories of things. So I think that one huge problem that we have is again, we have such a limited uh, working memory space that we're not able to juggle multiple thoughts at the same time that we often just fall to these shortcuts, these heuristics or biases that the brain has. And we're not living in the truth at all. We're not living in reality. We're living in a chemical bath induced illusion. Right? Mm. And this is mm. what philosophers have been telling us since time immemorial. You know, it's, it's nothing new with that. Yeah. But we're, we're, we're getting much more data about the negative and the positive effects that these things have. And then what we can do is we can work on our memory to allow ourselves to have greater perception of how it's happening to us in real time and live more effective lives. Because at least we can catch ourselves and apologize in time before impressions are created in the minds of others. Like I just tried to do with the whole capitalism thing, right? Because it's just... I don't know, but then that has a problem too, because then you have endless meta explanations, mm. explanations of the thing you said five minutes ago, and then you're going to have another explanation of this. And it's just, oh, there's a great uh, book, actually. It's called Girdle Escher Bach. Um, mm. And it is, oh, uh, Douglas Hofstadter wrote this. In mm. it, he has this passage, which I probably need to reread so that I'm not giving you my memory of the passage, but a more <laughs> accurate thing about how the passage actually is. But anyway, there's these two characters, tortoise and a hare. And the one of the characters has brought a record player and he says it can play any record, right? And the other character says, are you sure that it can play any record? And he cooks up a record that will break the record player. And they put it in the record player and sure enough, it breaks the record player. And so then that guy goes, look, I'm going to build another record player. And then it's just a game new record that breaks the record player over and over and over again. They're constantly reiterating the same game, but it's just bigger record players and bigger records and so forth. And in a sense, that's what humans are doing. This is that problem of recursion with, uh, you know, the internet 
not really being artificial intelligence, not really being artificial because it's trained on human stuff. But then there's going to be a new version. And then another new version, and then another new version, and that version is going to refer to the earlier version, and it's just a game of the record that breaks the record player until that they, well, it never ends. It just constantly yeah. refers back to itself. And this idea of reality as a thing that refers back to itself is a bit intellectually difficult. It took me years to finally understand it, but once I understood it, I was like, yeah, that probably is something like what reality is. Reality, like it doesn't matter. All our words, block time theory, times arrow. EMC equals MC squared this, you know, blah, 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 blah. All that stuff is always a reference to itself. And reality seems to be producing itself out of itself with no second. That's what the ancient Indian, you know, gurus were always talking about. Advaita Vedanta is like an argument for showing how reality produces itself out of itself without a second. Nothing outside of it. This is it. <laughs> Tatvam Asi. <laughs> and that's the thing we feel it's insulted so by, it's right? So like the fact that we are in this moment and we are nothing more beyond that. It's almost like we take offense to that going, no, but what about my family ancestry? What about my status in society? None of that stuff matters because it's all now. It's a chemical ongoing reaction that's producing what you're experiencing now. And what happened even three seconds back is dead and gone. But we want to hold on so much to this idea, this identity, this, this, the, the fact that we've existed and people be up before us have existed and people after us will exist. I think when what you say makes perfect sense and that's what, as you said, has been said in different versions across different cultures, different regions, across different texts, but we still can't get over the idea that we are inconsequential once we're not there. <laughs> well, that's because we have DNA and genetics and the laws of evolution that drive us to have egos that uh. make not only us think that we as individuals are important, but that our communities and the species itself is important. Mm. But really, there's actually zero reason for humans to survive other than the laws of evolution. So we are the slaves of our drives. Yeah. Nietzsche was one of the first philosophers to really nail this. I mean, he got it from Schopenhauer in a large degree. And of mm. course, Schopenhauer, he was able to study the Upanishads. I think he was one of the earliest people to benefit from those texts in the West. Hume may have gotten it before him. I don't know. I mean, I just stuff that I've, I've read from the history of philosophy. But mm. nonetheless, when those Western philosophers got in touch with some of that Eastern ideation about how reality is a production of itself, then Schopenhauer came up with the idea of the will. And this is kind of like hard to wrap your mind around, but the idea of the will is not that you have will, but that will has you, right? Mm -hmm. So why do you go out and hunt every day? Or why do you go out and work every day? It's because you want to? Hell no. It's because it's very hard to starve to death. In fact, Schopenhauer said, if you think you have will, the ultimate test is to try to starve yourself to death. Jump off the side of a mountain, right? That's impulse. That's, that's an easy suicide. Yeah. You want to really show that you have free will? Try to starve yourself. I know that's grim and I don't mean to have no, no, of a, course, but it makes a sense. negative tone, but I think that that's one of the most ultimate examples of how we don't have free will. Yeah. We don't have it at all. Will has us. It's driving us to do all this stuff. As I tell a friend of mine all the time, he asks me these questions. I say, the, the only reason why we're doing anything is because we got to do something until we die. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's nice if your will decides to give you a bunch of activities that are enjoyable as opposed to, you know, stuff that is, uh, if your will says, yeah, you got to just keep uh, pounding rock and you're like, oh, come on, I have free will. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the that's the cruelty of the universe, right? Yeah. Because there's all kinds of people who actually would be very, very, very content if they could pound rock all day. I've noticed that in my own life. Like I used to never get actually weightlifting stuff. I thought that's like the least of the things that are ever going to be interesting or help me or anything like that. But I finally like hit rock bottom with my health and then I had to. And I fell in love with just this mechanical task. You know, Henry Rollins. No, and I and you're right. I love steel, the idea of getting my hands in the mud and doing something. But I've been told that, hey, you, what are you going to do? I mean, come on. There's no, there's, I mean, you, unless, you're, you're, unless you're a qualified horticulturist or a gardener who's maintaining huge gardens. Otherwise, you're, you're a nobody. Like, especially in Indian society, like these jobs, like, you know, they're just seen as menial labor, like carpenters or uh, um, even plumbers. And, and that's such an injustice, right? 
oh, it's 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 just somebody talking, you know, and it bless their soul, but you know, blah blah blah. It's just more. But stuff. those people just just those people just talking has become a collective idea of what value we need to attach to certain people who have certain jobs, and as a result, now we live in a society in India where it's only information technology engineers, doctors who are held up in high regard. When who's taking care of society, right? Who's making the who's making the, society tick who's keeping it clean who's keeping it running the people who you are looked down who you look down upon and the jobs that you look down upon well i feel very strongly that that's just another example of swarm right yeah. and yeah. yeah there's there's massive amounts of people that are doing that but if you're fortunate enough to observe it and say okay that's what it is doesn't make it true doesn't make it something that i have to do yeah. then you're free i mean yeah. you're you're not maybe totally free but but freer, observation yeah. Critical yeah. thinking is the thing that allows you that, hey, I like IT, I'm going to be involved in it, but it, not because of X, Y, and Z. That's called golden handcuffs. You can be very, very successful in whatever's trending, but still be miserable in it, or you can be tremendously satisfied because you genuinely like it, or you can have both of those things where you hate it for 10 years and then suddenly you fall in love with it, or you love it for 10 years and suddenly you hate it. And it's just like, why that people have this vision of, well, set and forget. I found my career. I'm good. And mm. that's going to be it. That, that makes so, no sense. Like there's no evidence that that ever happens to anybody. Uh, yes, sometimes it does. But even even like I love to read biographies uh, of people. Mm. And, you know, there, there are long years where authors have hated being an author. You mm. know? Or there are people who spend their entire lives, they write hell bent on some kind of success then they die like kafka and his friend you know uh, max broad decides yeah. that he's not going to burn all of kafka's writings and uh then kafka becomes this smash hit <laughs> around the world right you know? mm. uh it's just like there's all kinds of things that can happen and to focus your mind on you know it must be this or it must be that or you you know you shouldn't be into gardening because blah 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 that's just monkey mind chatter distracting you from the glory of being able to do anything at all you know mm. cool yeah. garden do it yeah <laughs> you know it's interesting you mentioned the bike so i'm uh in the process i'm working on a book right now and i'm um looking back at certain points and at least a, at least a, a start point um so people who've listened to this podcast obviously I apologize if I'm going with the same story, but I want to ask you uh, a certain number of a certain thing with context of memory because uh, so when I was about between the age of eight and nine, I had this thing thing happen to me where I uh, basically overnight lost my vision to Stargardt's disease, which is a form of macular degeneration. So I lost my central vision overnight, and ever since um, I've been, and that's the thing with memory, right? I, I don't want to put in th ideas or rather make up ideas because they suit what people want to hear about a person with a disability. And that's something I clearly want to avoid. And I, I don't even want to make the book about disabilities, about a certain thing uh, which is my life, a certain story. So the thing with memory is that for me, it almost feels like before that instance or that incident in 1990, it's, it's not very clear, but there are certain things which are very clear post that, uh, especially when it comes to certain instances where I was maybe, um, where I felt like hurt or I felt very sort of, um, I mean, what's the word? I, I felt not good enough. And those mm -hmm. things, um, and the, but the examples like, I mean, and of course, even a lot of good memories have stuck on, but what, what happens when, and, and of course, I want you to talk about your story. I don't. I don't want to make this about mine, but I want this as an example because people have heard me talk about this. So just to give some context, what happens to memories when something? I, the word trauma is something I've been un, not. I don't want to throw around loosely, but uh, when something like that happens, what happens to your memories like around that instant, in, that instance, and that that time, and and how how does the mind create stuff like that? And the main reason I'm I'm, I'm working on this book is to kind of put to rest a lot of the ways I looked at the world uh, with, and, and, and also the premise I operated from from a long time is that I'm not good enough and look at the world around me, they have everything I don't. But I want to take that away and the focus now is I do have certain things and as you said, I'm thrown into the world with it. Let's work with it. So I just want to get mm -hmm. your thoughts on that. Oh, there's so much to say about that. Uh, so 
Yeah, there's a lot of memory science around how trauma forms and so forth. Uh, it can be an implicit memory sort of thing where it becomes automatic and, and unconscious mm -hmm. and it just keeps repeating itself and building. But, but specifically around this issue of disability or in your case, not, not seeing, mm. I think you've probably had this effect that you, you, you or others might tell you this, that you probably now see better than others, right? Uh, even if you can't see. And mm. that's... That's again, this principle of reification, giving the word sight or vision some special meaning over other forms of perception. Mm. And I've written about this in some, uh, in some length because I released a novel recently mm. that has a detective who has early cognitive decline and PTSD. Mm. And he's going to lose his career if he doesn't start remembering stuff better. And... Mm. His best friend is a guy named Jerome, and Jerome is the world's only blind memory competitor. Mm. And he acts like, you know, a, a memory competitor, and he doesn't really care about his blindness and all this sort of stuff. And the detective says of his friend, he says, he sees better than five people combined because mm. he actually observes the incoming information, right? Right. So there's like a... The, the, and we see this again and again and again with the topic of disability and all this sort of stuff, right? Disability is in the mind. You know, I can, my business mentor for many years, John Morrow, he runs a multi million dollar operation, and the only thing that he can move is his mouth. Johannes Malo is one of the greatest memory competitors in the world. He has an issue with his body now, he has to be in a wheelchair. He had a kind of confidence thing for a, br a brief period of time where he's mm. like, I really want to go to the world memory competition, but you know, how am I going to drag this body to China to, and he just, he made it happen. He got the uh, wheelchair into the plane and he got to China and he competed and he had a blast. So a lot of disability is just in the mind. And that's why I wanted to include this quote unquote blind memory champion character, but yeah. Jerome, the blind memory champion, I didn't just cook him out of nowhere. There's a guy I interviewed on my podcast named um, Jared Guzzins, and I met him in Brisbane. And he's like this really great entrepreneur who's, if memory serves, he's blind from birth. Mm. And he owns a business, an incredibly successful business. He has apparently flown a plane. I mean, I don't think he did take off or landing. But, you right. know, he learned enough to be able to actually pilot it for a while. He's apparently summited Everest. You can watch him on YouTube. He, he's uh, won a dance competition. I don't know. Like, the, the things just go down the line. Yeah. And the most extraordinary thing happened when I interviewed him on my podcast. And it was one of the – at that time, it wasn't, like, easy with Zoom or whatever. Anyway, he came to my – he came to my office with his dog. And so mm. we were able to shoot a video version together. And at the end of the interview, I guess I was asking him something about, you know, like, how do you keep a good mental attitude, blah, blah, blah. And he had this backpack with him. He reaches down. He goes into his backpack. He pulls out a mirror. A guy who's never seen a day in his life, quote unquote, see. And he says, I carry this mirror with me everywhere I go, because whenever I have a sob moment and a poor me moment, I look at my face in the mirror and I remind myself that it's up to me. Disability is in the mind. He uses his mind and the metaphors of sight the same way that we do. He looks in the mirror, even though he can't see himself, and he takes responsibility for himself. There's a great quote, which is the only difference between men and monkeys, is that monkeys look in the mirror and they see monkeys. It's only humans who see anything other than monkey. So he knows how to use language in that sophisticated way that it's up to him. But that's, we that's... also have to factor in the fact that there's no free will, there's circumstance, there's chance, there's luck. And it's a failing on my behalf, actually, because I didn't really ask him enough. Where did you get such incredible attitude? What yeah. was the context? Who were the people who nurtured that? What were the books that you read, etc.? So I got to invite him again because, you know, I missed out on some really important questions. Yeah, I think I need to get, get him on, on here as well because it just seems like it's absolutely not specific to a condition whether it's um mental or rather with especially with, with disability it's it's so much more you can put five blind people or visually impaired people together and they all will have different ways they look at life and i think this 
is so important to recognize, right? And that's something I'm trying to do because I'm just trying to make peace with I, I, with a lot of this bag. I wouldn't say burden, I would, but I would say a lot of the ways I was conditioning myself to look at life were very heavy and kind of weighing me down. And that's something I want to let go of. And that's some, the reason why I'm kind of attempting it in the form of do, documenting these past 30 two years in a book it's just sort of like you know what let it be there and let me now keep it aside and let me sort of free up my shoulders and do some lifting <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. anyway trauma you have feedback right and yeah. so if circumstances allow you to constantly have that pain story reiterated with the pain context it's going to continue to be painful get more painful but if you can find a way to have a feedback loop that helps mm. you contextualize it, you know, in GQ magazine, there's a it's not a it's not necessarily a trauma story, although it probably has traumatic elements. There's a story with George Clooney in GQ magazine, I'm sure it was, where he had some kind of accident, which is why where the trauma element may come in. And he wound up with uh, chronic pain mm. and that chronic pain has apparently never gone away. But he found a therapist who helped him use his mind to contextualize the experience of pain in the larger field, so to speak, of sensations, and then not feel so much in pain anymore. And I think that that is something we can learn to do with all kinds of things, uh, emotional pain, and we know it. And there's a, a, uh, some great research I refer to often that helped me. I, I mean, I, I learned about it after the fact, but the principle helped me so much. Tim Dalglish has released these like scientific articles with long, complicated terms, method of loci as a device for alleviating PTSD and depression symptoms, you know, the, these kind of titles. What that mm. means is that people use the memory palace to take trauma that led to PTSD and depression. A memory palace is when you take a room and you layer images that help you remember something mm. on a feature of the room. So if you have a couch or a chair or a bookshelf, you would put something mentally in that area and then it would remind you of a happy memory or a word that you want to remember in a language or a phrase. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to take 10 happy memories, this research very clearly shows that by the time you triggered off three or four of them, you're not feeling bad anymore. So if you take your trauma mm -hmm. and you just put it where it is or leave it alone and you focus on happy things, when the trauma comes, Rather than reinforcing it with more trauma, you go to your happy memory pal palace. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Sherlock Holmes says, I must go to my mind palace. Well, yeah. instead of doing that to solve a crime or whatever, you solve the crime of trauma that refers to itself. This is like our theme, right? Reality refers to itself. So the trauma refers mm -hmm. to itself and it builds and builds and builds. Instead, you go to this collection of happy memories, you trigger them off, and then you start to feel better, right? It can still be that you have all the memories of trauma and you can still be happy. One thing that I did is I had some bad experiences when I was a kid that led me to have a disability of the mind. Yeah. And I, I mean, I just thought I got to heal this. So I went to the home in which the bad stuff happened mm -hmm. and I memorized a piece that's called Nirvana Shatakam or sometimes it's called Atma Shatakam mm -hmm. and it's in Sanskrit. Yeah. And I used that home filled with trauma to memorize it. Mm -hmm. And I have never been so free of all that stuff. It's better than forgiven and forgotten. I can mm. actually think about it without being triggered. And that's what we want, right? We don't want to erase memory. We want to be okay and even blissful and grateful that we have memory at all. And if a memory arises that we don't like, we don't have a hissy fit or a conniption or our entire day is ruined. We're able to embrace that memory with love, with care, and say, there you are again, and you don't bother me anymore, you know? Whew. Blow it out like a candle. That's the sweet spot. Yeah. So so what? how did you get on this path um, of understanding and um, exploring memories? What was your reason to go down um, exploring this? Well, this is the part where I tell my story and rewire my memory of myself. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but, <laughs> if you, you, don't, you don't want to, it's absolutely fine. If, no, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I, I do refer to that because it is a, an interesting thing because yeah. I tell the story so many different ways. But 
the long story short is that I was clinically depressed. I had spent time in a mental hospital, like mm. lots of time, three months of time. And I had manic depression di as a diagnosis and was just in a real bad spot. I was either going to jump off a bridge or I was going to, I don't know what, I was going to quit school. And it just happened that I was at school one time at the university and you know, I couldn't read, I couldn't concentrate, I couldn't do anything, and I was just in a bad place. And it was also winter in Toronto, snow 14 mm. feet high, blah, 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 really bad. And I was at school, and there's a part of York University in Toronto called York Lanes, which is kind of like a nice summer lane, even in the middle of winter, the way that they've got it all worked out. You feel like you're on a street inside. And there were the, this was in the era of David Blaine first doing his like street magic stuff. And these, this guy came up to me and he's doing this street magic and it triggered a memory in my mind because I used to do magic when I was a kid mm. and I wasn't really super impressed with his trick, but I grabbed his deck of cards and I was like, can I show you something? And I showed him a trick that I remembered from when I was a kid and he was totally blown away and he was like, whoa, how do you do that? Anyway, then I went home and I thought, oh, I'm not going to study. I hate this studying, but this, well, I didn't, I don't hate studying. I hated not being able to concentrate on the information because my mind was so fogged up it was fogged up from the depression but it was also doubly fogged up because the pills weren't working you know mm. and it was just I, I was even drooling out of the side of my mouth from the antipsychotics that i was on at the time Ouch. and mm. maybe at that time i needed to be because i was filled with like destructive impulses self-destructive impulses mm. so um you know okay so that's the situation but what i found is that i could concentrate on this new thing called well, actually, maybe YouTube wasn't even a thing yet. But anyway, I remember we were talking about downloading stuff. A friend had downloaded me a bunch of magic training videos. Hmm. And I started to watch these magic training videos. And with interest and passion, I could learn magic. And in the magic videos, there's a trick called any card at any number. And I wanted to learn this. And a couple ways that you can do it. But one of them involves having a memorized deck. Hmm. And I thought, no way. I can't even read a sentence you know, in any language. And I was under pressure to actually learn a language for my PhD. And I was just like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> but something attracted me to try to memorize a deck of cards. And lo and behold, I could. And I could quite quickly. And something triggered in my mind. If I can get information from books onto cards, I'll be able to memorize them in the same way. Mm -hmm. And I still couldn't read, but somehow I got this idea. What if I read out loud? Then it doesn't matter really whether I can concentrate or not. And I did that. And then I would be able to hear in my own mind the ideas that were important. I would put them on cards. Then I would use those cards as if they were a deck of cards and I'd memorize them. And then I started to feel better. And this is more than a decade before I read the Tim Douglas research. And mm. now I know why I was feeling better, which is a lot of science words about dopamine and myelin sheaths and you know all these chemicals that build in the brain when you're doing memory-based activities. But wow... I was still suffering. I was still depressed, but I felt better. And I had the confidence and long story short, I didn't drop out. I didn't jump off a bridge. I went and I sat for my very intense and stressful exams. I went and wrote my dissertation. I sat for the dissertation defense and I'll never forget the first time someone called me doctor. And it, and then the first thing that we did to go down and celebrate was we went to the pub underneath where I was examined called the absinthe pub. Actually, it's not exactly underneath, but anyway, it was more or less underneath. And I performed magic for the examination committee. And it was the most fun in the world <laughs> that I really ever had. Hey, that's a uh, great. Um, it was all done. just magic. It was the magic of memory and the magic of magic with magic cards, you know, tricks and oh, it was just a great thing. And then more miracles unfolded and I wound up teaching this stuff. So, it's so how great. is memory... Uh such a powerful tool. I mean, I know you've spoken about it in, in things, but in, in, in building positive um, uh, associations or helping in your situation get you out of that, what does it do, uh, if you could just explain, and maybe also talk about that, uh, w what what a memory competition looks like. And um, mm. yeah, and... Sure, sure. So memory competitions are really fascinating. And there's many, many different kinds depending on where it is in the world. Sometimes there are online memory competitions now. And basically, just to give a broad stroke, generalize knowing that they're different, 
depending how they're done, you're going to have categories of information. And so you're going to be tested on your ability to deal with different kinds of information. And the person who essentially memorizes the most with the least amount of mistakes wins. Ah, And so you have playing cards is one thing that people will memorize numbers. And there's a difference between numbers that you read on a page and numbers that you hear spoken. Those are different disciplines. Yeah. And you have vocabulary, you might have poetry and they try to figure out challenges that very few people will have an advantage in. Right. Mm. So for example, they don't have language learning typically because it'd be very easy for somebody who knows the the language that's being tested that day to have an advantage if they're fluent in that language. So it's kind of cool. They're trying to like, even the stakes so that it's raw skill. Now, the irony of it all is, is that they use memory techniques just to memorize that information. So it's like weightlifting of the mind. It's not Mm. really learning. In fact, I'm a little bit suspicious that we should even call it memorization at all. It's kind of like short-term recall of lots of information. But memorization is actually, you know, long-term. So anyway, but there's still memory competitions. It's still still memory. And I've done it. I did actually quite well. I I, I came quite close to, uh, I, I competed with Dave Farrow, who has two Guinness World Records. And oh. I shouldn't say I came quite close. I did half as well as he did in this in this competition. <laughs> That's so, pretty good. Um, he, yeah. he doubled what I did, but yeah. I'd never competed before ever. I never even practiced to compete. And that's, he himself would tell you this. And he said this on that day. People that learned the techniques that very afternoon at the competition they still gave him a run for his money. So it's really cool how the techniques work. Once you learn how to use them, you can, within an afternoon, be doing really quite well, as well as somebody with lots of experience. Um, Because, you know, even even the most experienced people, they will have a bad day and they won't necessarily always perform the same way. And uh, so who knows? I think Dave Farrow was either being really kind to me and he stopped... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when, when he doubled it or he was having a bad day because i know he can do a lot more a lot faster anyway he's right. a really cool guy um but that's what competitions are like and there's many many different kinds and i love them they're fun so why is memory such a powerful tool to en- enrich your life or to get you out of a certain place because i want to tie this up with a couple of things before you wind up is because we have such a fear of losing our memories right dementia alzheimer's um and and okay so maybe what um i don't talk about what happens to the brain or the mind uh when you but um yeah so how can memories or the power of memory get us out of it from a bad place and also how can we hold on to it or rather keep it so we can kind of live more fulfilling lives Mm. well memory really comes down to your ability to to recall the information that matters when you need it to navigate the world in the best possible way. And when you make a mistake, remember to be humble and graceful. Now, in terms mm. of preserving your memory for the long term, it really comes down to taking care of your diet, your sleep, your fitness, all that kind of stuff. And if you want to exercise your memory and fend off things like dementia and Alzheimer's, you want to be doing language learning, music, having lots of conversations with lots of people. And, you know, if you can play memory friendly games with a limited amount of online exposure. So there's a lot of apps out there that are not really exercising your memory or Mm. they're exercising your memory in what's called a context dependent way, which means that they're giving you a memory boost while you play their game that does not transfer to Mm. outside of the game, which is, Maybe fun while you're playing the game, but if you're doing that to get better memory outside of the game, it's just wasting your time. So I would encourage people to read a lot more. And if they really want that extra boost and that zing, use memory techniques, but not as the memory competitors do. Do it as people like myself do, which is with memory palaces. And we use memory palaces in a particular way that helps get the information into long-term memory. So if I give a a talk, like a TEDx talk or whatever, I memorized that and I memorized it so that I hold it for the long term. That Sanskrit piece that I talked Mm -hmm. about, I have four big Sanskrit pieces 
and I have a fifth that I'm working on. And these things are not the same as the memory competitors use. I use the techniques. They're very similar, but I use them in a slightly different way in order to establish long-term memory. And that practice, you can see in lots of studies, because it's a foreign language, verbatim memorization, you're getting benefits that relate to the benefits that people have bilingualism get, which is called mm -hmm. cognitive reserve. And cognitive reserve is essentially this. You can still get Alzheimer's and dementia, but be less impacted because you have done this brain training. You have reserve that, it, like the word, fortifies your brain. Uh, and it, it can also help you if you have a stroke that you can mm. recover a lot faster. So you have, everybody has every reason to be learning a language, learning music, but also using memory techniques because of these benefits that not only help you learn those things faster, but also double down on the cognitive reserve that you're going to develop. And, you know, I have really bad days where I don't feel good and I still have depression that I have to deal with. You'd never know because I'm just able to rely on inner resources and that cognitive reserve itself to get by and to, to bounce back and still be operational. And I can do it without the pills that, you know, <laughs> I used to take because no, I don't take any anymore. That's brilliant, you know, because it's it's just such a nice story of you not relying on being sick, right? I mean, of course, it's not easy and it's not all about the, the winds and the, 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 the walking into the sunset. But just the fact that you could get out of it on your own with, of course, these things that you chose to use, is, is, it's tremendous. And, you know, thanks for sharing that story with me. I just add the nuance. It's not ever about me on my own. Yeah. I was really, really fortunate and lucky to just bump into people who said certain things. And the real thing that is, is just that I was in the mental space where I could hear it, where I could see it. And I think that's the other advantage of memory training because your consciousness expands and you're paying more attention to what's coming in in real time. And that allows you to take action on more things because you paid attention to it in the first place. So that's another thing. So many people never implement because they don't even pay attention to the rich advice that's been just given to them it's mm. in one ear and out the next right uh, and it's just wow i'm fortunate that that happened to me because it easily could have been the case that it didn't so mm. i would just encourage people to 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 pay attention to this there is a thing called speed of implementation and that rule says that if you hear a thing that sounds right for you implement on it immediately as soon as possible because every second that goes by exponentially reduces the likelihood that you're going to take action on it in the future uh -huh. and so if you hear about a book instead of humming and hawing over 20 bucks get the damn book as soon as possible <laughs> and then when it comes to you read it as soon as possible because this rule says and it shows and everybody knows this intuitively once they think about it it just never happens if you don't do it right away, or that's the common trend. So if you feel called to look into memory, look at me, look at whoever, just get into it as soon as you can, because it is scientifically valid and it is historically been around for thousands upon thousands of years. And not only that, but you don't have to believe in it. It works if yeah. you just do the work. If you become the scientist in the laboratory of your own mind and you take action on it, it's it's very hard for it not to work. And that's the coolest thing in the world. And you'll see what I mean once you're into it. But you have to like hear it and do it. So where can possible. people come and check out some of the work you've put out or some of the resources you're talking about? Yeah, well, if you want to find my stuff, magneticmemorymethod.com is the, the mothership. And if you can't remember that, Anthony and memory should do the trick. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, on the major... Uh, search engines i will come up i mean magnetic memory method dot com I, mean, I think that's uh yeah, yeah. i think that's the least they can remember <laughs> well yeah but we you know we don't want to assume because i have had people struggle even with that that's where their memory is at so mm. and I, I and you know i'm happy to help those people but we've got to have uh <laughs> we, anyway there's there's lots and lots of memory training out there and just try to find somebody who's actually gels with you somehow and follow that speed of implementation rule. Yeah. Because 
you do need to implement this. Nobody can do memory training for you in the same yeah. way that nobody can go to the gym and lift the barbells for you. you it, it, it's for you to do. And you'll maybe have a, a hard day once in a while. You're, you're the, 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 the chain on your mental bike might be rusty, but <laughs> that's what you got to do is you got to get it moving and put some oil on it and you'll feel so good so quickly. It's unbelievable. So I, I hope that helps and just search for memory. Find people that are cool and and do what they say. <laughs> now that's such a encouraging um, message and encouraging sort of way for people to kind of take their life into their own hands. So thanks so much for uh, sharing all the things that you've been through and the things that you've learned about yourself and the things that helped you learn about yourself and empower your life. But and thanks for a lovely chat. It was absolutely lovely. Well, well, thank you for making it lovely. I appreciate that very much. Cheers, Anthony and. Um, yeah, I really um, appreciate you coming on here today and, and talking to me. Oh, I appreciate it as well. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.